I wrote a song called I Sigh For You, Sigh with mm -hmm. a Double Meaning. I wrote a boogie woogie called Happy Birthday Baba. Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think it's, I never really heard happy birthday songs to him like that before. And I know, and I sang a slow blues called Big Daddy, because sometimes they used to call him Big Daddy. <laughs> Dana Gillespie is an English actress, singer, and songwriter, a gifted blues singer internationally acclaimed. And for decades, she has been devoted to holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba. Her first visit to India to see Sai Baba, she tells me, possibly 40 years ago. This is the first non-blues spiritual song I ever heard Dana sing 17 years ago at a Sai Baba retreat in Chicago. In this soldier's video, a tour of Dana's London home, her stories with Sai Baba, and more from her deep, resonant, powerful voice that only gets stronger with age. And then there's this. Among her many blessings, Dana Gillespie was chosen to be the very first singer in Andrew Lloyd Webber's London stage debut of Jesus Christ Superstar for one of the show's most important songs. And I can honestly say, this is obviously before Sai Baba's time, but I was taken over by some other presence when I sang that song. My voice filled the whole thing. I came off stage crying. I don't know how to take this. Also from Jesus Christ Superstar, Dana Gillespie given the opportunity of a lifetime with her role in the original London cast with another iconic song. Try not to get worried, try not to turn on to problems that upset you. Oh, don't you know everything's all right. She has led a storied life and still does, a life rich with spiritual luster and the blues. I, I was given a book, Man of Miracles, I couldn't sleep all night. I read every word. On page one, I knew that this was for me. And I did something I never did. I organized that I must go as fast as quickly as possible to India. And I kept feeling that he's waiting for me, the ego, the ego. But I thought he'd be there saying, you've come, I've been waiting for you. And of course, he completely ignored me for 12 years. Yeah. But you had to make a, a, a search for things. And I've always read spiritual books. In fact, I thought I was so learned ego again that I was surprised that I hadn't heard of who Sai Baba was. Om Shakti, Om Shakti, Om Shakti, Shiva Shakti, Om. Welcome to Soul Drum. This interview was recorded in London in April of 2016, where we were talking about meditation. This is what I call Swami's room, actually. I could call it my meditation room, but it's not that either because I'm not the greatest meditator in the world. I, if I'm in a good state, actually, I will do about 10 minutes and I have a sort of routine that I do. So we would call this the attic being the top floor of the this house. This is the top floor. If I have somebody that is stuck for a bed, they can occasionally sleep here, but I'm always rather miserable about it. Because well, they wouldn't have to go looking very far for pillows. No, and all these cushions, well, all the ones that Rescue. have Indian themes, my mother did them. Oh. All the ones with Sarvadharma things, I did them. And all the others I have rescued from hideous picture frames in car boot sales, flea markets. When you say you did them, 
Did you actually make them? Well, I actually made those, especially in the days when you could sit and put a party and take a needle and thread in, in and on the aeroplane. So that's how you would while away the three hours before Swami would come out. Yes, exactly. Were, was anybody else doing that? No, no. I used to have them. I got a friend of mine kind of did the outline for me. I did quite a few, actually. Swami has sat on about three of them. I've got, well, I, I've seen <laughs> photographic evidence of it because he'd go into Rajmata's house and sit on them. That and you were telling it. me earlier that when you bought this house 40-some years ago, this altar was here. This altar was here. The woman before me, to be fair, had a Buddha in it, but there was an altar waiting for me to fill it up. And, yeah. of course, when I first went to Swami shortly after moving into this house, didn't quite know what I was going to put in there, but the moment I came back, the first trip, when it was 38 and I keep pointing out the empty spaces you have yet to fill with photos of Baba. <laughs> I mean, you've got spaces yet for another half dozen photographs. What I love are the very old pictures of Swami that I got. Oh, uh, this one I've never seen. I got that in a, in a framer's shop in Bangalore, down near Russell Market, the Muslim area in Bangalore. And nobody kind of wanted those you ones. You've got down there in the corner. I mean, I come from, you know, I started at the age of 15. I was the, you know, I made my first record LPs, of course, in those days. You know, this was 1964, 65. And in those days, when they didn't put credits on the LPs, I had musicians like Jimmy Page, who then turned into Led Zeppelin. I mean, I don't know whether if this means anything to you, but I grew up in this area in London so that Stones and Beatles and all these guys were people I just hung out with because we all grew up together. And of course I was straight in in the music business and went through from being a folk singer and then in the early 70s, one of my oldest friends, David Bowie, he he got me on one of his albums, the Ziggy Stardust al al album, Stiggy, Ziggy Stardust, and sort of started so producing. So you were on those albums? I was on one of them and then he wrote a song for me called Andy Warhol. I, we had the same management com company. We were in, in the same record deal and everything in America. And somebody slipped your name to Andrew Lloyd Webber, apparently. Well, that was b most bizarre. This was a little early. In 1973, I, I, Bowie and I were both out of work, and we both went to audition for a musical called Hair, where you've got to get your clothes off. Yeah. Neither of us got the part, thank God. <laughs> but, you know, if you need a gig, you need a gig. A gig's a gig. So then I answered an advertisement in a magazine called The Stage, which is the sort of theatrical paper over here, and it said they wanted just chorus line, uh, chorus dancers and singers for Jesus Christ Superstar. And in those days, it was incredibly shocking to put the word superstar next to Jesus Christ. And I went in, they gave me the part in the chorus, but before they opened, they actually removed the girl who was going to play Mary and put the part to me and from the moment I had been there as the chorus I kept thinking I kept hearing in my head you will be Mary you will be Mary and I kept thinking I was almost going mad but then a week before the show opened it happened and it was the first time I'd sung they had to I had to sort of pass an audition to sing that song I don't know how to love him in the palace theater which is 3,000 seater mm -hmm. and I can honestly say this is obviously before Sai Baba's time but I was taken over by some other presence when I sang that song my voice filled the whole thing I came off stage crying was this an audition this was an audition just to be the understudy what oh, the, okay because the, you you said initially I was just they... in the chorus the show hadn't opened mm -hmm. we were just rehearsing but you have to have an understudy in case Mary Magdalene is ill and I did that and by the afternoon they'd removed the the other girl. So who was it who made that decision? Well, it was the the angels, as they're known, the money bags, and uh, <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice, the writers. This voice, we think, will carry the song better than the <laughs> first voice we had Well, it's also a thing of looks. I mean, you know, Mary Magdalene has to look as if she's kind of a bit of a hot chick. I was in those <laughs> days. And, you know, I've never been flat-chested. Not that that's really anything to do with anything. But, you know, I kind of looked more the part. Mm -hmm. And I did it for a year, but I had to leave after a year. So I did the crucifixion eight times a week. Well, watch Jesus eight times a week for a year. And then I left to have a knee operation because mm -hmm. I'd been caught in an avalanche earlier. My knee was bad. Mm -hmm. So I then went in, into all sorts, you know, I was just off into America, I was swanning around in all sorts of mad films and theatre things at the National Theatre. And then 
I suppose it was about 38 years ago, and I was already singing blues by then, which of course blues, I specialise in all the slightly risque lyrics from the 20s, 30s and 40s, I, because I have a sense of humour, <laughs> and they had a sense of humour in those days, and I grew up listening to the blues and singing the blues. And uh, I, I was given a book, Man of Miracles, is this what yes. you're going to ask me, by the way? How did I first hear about something? You're doing fine. No, I don't have to ask any questions. <laughs> Probably not. You you're say, given the book Man of Miracles. Man of Miracles, Murphy. yes. And I was on a 12-hour train journey from Zurich to Vienna. And I remember it was an Indian printed one given by a friend. And, she, and I thought, well, this is, I've got nothing to read, but it's a thin book. I'll read it in half an hour. I couldn't sleep all night. I read every word. On page one, I knew that this was for me. I knew... I had this calling, it was as if I'd been hit in my heart and on my head. And I did something I never did, I organised that I must go as fast as quickly as possible to India. Three weeks later I'm on a plane and I kept feeling that he's waiting for me, the ego, the ego. I thought I would arrive in put a party and I didn't know anybody to ask anything about anything to do with put a party but I thought he'd be there saying, you've come, I've been waiting for you and of course he completely ignored me for 12 years. Yeah, I was going to say, not just for your first visit, but for 12 years. Yeah, it was okay. I slept in the sheds. You know, you make real good friends there. Uh, um, you have to watch for the snakes, too. And uh, I never saw, I'd never seen a snake in <laughs> India. And I just, I just knew I was meant to be there. I mean, I had a lot of amazing, rather bizarre, but not by Swami standards, experiences. But things that let me know that he could read my heart. But you were raised in the Church of England, and yes. you were drawn to this wild field called music and entertainment and the blues and, and uh, the West End Theater, and everything that was not spiritual in a way, in a manner of speaking, how could you ever make that leap so easily, so seamlessly, to something quite deep and quite profound? Well, the, I was confirmed in the Church of England when I was about 12. That's the one confirmation. Yeah, occur. and I knew then that I never wanted to step into a cider church again <laughs> because I hated the fact that the, I was constantly being told only through Jesus can you have salvation. Yeah. I kept thinking, what about all the others? And I've come from quite a well traveled family. I mean, it's not like I've been to countries where people aren't only Christian. This bothered me. But even in the my teenage years of being growing up in the music business, musicians are usually quite spiritual in my my experience. And the ones that were around in the 60s, there was something happening in the 60s. There was a kind of magic. Uh, we'd be going off to listen to, uh, to sitar concerts, mm -hmm. um, which sounds silly now because you can see everything you want on the stage, but it, it, now on screens and things. But you had to make a, a, a search for things. And I've always read spiritual books. In fact, I thought I was so learned, ego again, that I was surprised that I hadn't heard of who Sai Baba was. I've always had a great interest in Gurdjieff and all things Sufism and all religions, but not that interested in the one I was born into. Well, there weren't too many called to him at that time. I missed the year if you gave it when you first went there after you read. Do you know, I can't remember. Okay, it's it was... somewhere between 32 and 38 or 40 years ago. I okay. can't, you told me that you can remember how many interviews you've had. I haven't a clue. I've lost track. Well, that's because I've had <laughs> well, how a many? pitiful few number. Okay, me, well, to me too, compared. No, I can't remember how many trips I've been to India. Yeah. I can't even remember what, what I did last. Oh, I know what I did on Sunday because we were in Leicester <laughs> together. Right. We were in Leicester <laughs> together. And you sang so wonderfully. In the <laughs> And as I saw with my own eyes, Dana Gillespie knows only one way to perform before a crowd, no matter wherever she goes, full tilt. And you sang so wonderfully and you cut it to a measly 20 minutes and I was looking for about two hours of a concert. Well, that's what I often do, because about 15 years ago, after having been ignored, by mm -hmm. the way, for years, and I was used to that at Cybar, I was with my bad leg, I was always at the back, 
Would you go by yourself? Or yeah, you always on my own. Didn't know anybody For there. For 12 years. He and never nobody, looked at you? He never talked I to you? He might have had the odd glance, but he certainly never spoke to me. The mm -hmm. first words were when I told this story to you on Sunday about hiding the cassette in my bra. Oh, that was... Uh, an outstanding story. Do you <laughs> mind repeating it now? Yeah, I will. A lot of side devotees actually know it, but it was a hot muggy day, as I recall, when it was stuck in <laughs> it your. It was. Bar. I was. I. I. You know, the thing is, when you're always at the back, I was quite content to just see one hair of his sticking out from behind a <laughs> pillar. I got used to that. That was enough for me. I was totally and utterly happy just with that. And as I recall, you actually wrote these songs. I'm not sure if they were budgeons or what, but they were about and for Sai Baba. The first one was actually just budgeons, because I've always had a feeling that budgeons, so beautiful they are, so marvellous, the melodies. I don't like messing with the melodies. I might put a different feel sometimes, mm -hmm. but the melodies are what lure me. And I thought if I come back, and with a friend of mine, we did the first album, and I thought I'll call myself one to one. Uh, I thought I'll call myself third man, because it, the first album was called One to One, because I didn't want blues fans to be thinking, oh, I'm going to buy a blues album with some <laughs> naughty lyrics, and what have I got here? Something in Sanskrit <laughs> that I don't understand. Anyway, so I, CDs had more or less just been invented then, so I thought if I go back to India and I offer it to him on a cassette, if he somehow blesses it, then that means I can print it up as a CD. And if he blesses it, then it's my life's ambition to try and get this kind of music to as many places that I can all over the world. And boy, did he bless it. Well, he did, yes, because for w two weeks go by, I'm always at the back, and I'm thinking, how am I, should I, what should I do with this blasted cassette? And finally, on the last day, I thought, right. The last right, day, which is so typical. Isn't it just, wait, he waits till you're on a cliffhanger. <laughs> And then I just thought, well, I'll have to stick it in a sort of thick padded brown envelope, this cassette, stick it under here, my bra, mm -hmm. basically, <laughs> and see if hopefully I won't get caught out smuggling this thing in. And, the you know, when you go through this kind of security, nobody, I mean, they pad you down a bit, but nobody found it. And I suddenly found myself in the front row, and he'd never spoken to me before, and nobody knew I was a singer. He comes walking straight out, stands right in front of me and just says, ha, huh, the singer, give me the cassette. Oh, come on. So then I had the embarrassing thing to get the cassette out, but it was hot and Were sweaty. Were you shocked? N no, actually. These are the first words he says to you. Yes, but you know, I've always known that he knows everything. Uh, so well, these two, Swami gave me those two little pots. Um, both times they were bursting with vibhuti and both times he said now you put the vibhuti on your knee because of course I've always had a bad knee mm -hmm. and you come back when the pot is empty so I came back he gave me another pot you put that on your knee every day come back when the pot is empty and um, so I did and he did some more things didn't totally cure it but it kept me going for much longer than I probably would have and would have had to have had It looks these. like you've got iconography from all the world's religions and... That's true. I've always been very drawn to all things sort of from Arab countries, Muslim things. Probably why I love all the Sarva Dharma bhajans that have got things like Allahu Akbar in them. As well, a, I heard that the other day. Yeah. As a child, I used to cry sometimes when I saw the word Allah written down in it. You, you said that, and it med immediately I, I, I felt a vibration that I didn't expect to feel inside of a Sai Baba event. So well, do you sing that often, something uh, that has... Uh, yeah, I've got a lot of those, because I used to... I mean, I've done quite a lot of... Um, um, you know, that speaking, Arab-speaking mm -hmm. language in Muslims, I mean, in the Russian territories. So I've got like that, mm -hmm. which is the kebab, but then above it I've got sati by an Indian woman. <laughs> <laughs> so this is another really early one I found in an, about 35 years ago in Bangalore. I love these very early Oh, this ones. is a famous one. I mean, in, in that I've seen this many times, and it's a great photograph. Yeah, it's like the, but it's the fact that it's that old style of printing yes. as well, yes. which they don't do anymore. I think I think that's hand tinted. Yeah, probably. And I've had been always obsessional about all things Arabic, so you can see or and, Indian. And where do you think that came from? Past life, I guess. I don't really like to talk about past lives, but I've no idea where else to were say. You, it came were from. you raised in any form nope. of regular religion in this lifetime? Um, C of E. 
See the Church of England. Church okay. of England, very... Episcopalian, we'd call you in the States. Of course, it's Anglican you, here. Are you going this way or yes. are we going down? This way, okay. No. <laughs> so this is... This is your bed. This is my bed. And what do you do with the pillows when you go to sleep? I throw them on the floor and I make them neat and tidy <laughs> every day. Here so, are my, it's two of my favorite paintings in the world. Okay, these are, I'm going to get a little light on this. These are two degrees of Freemasonry oil paintings, and I guess by now worth a lot. I've been very, uh, very interested in Freemasonry. Sadly. Well, it's very mysterious to me still even though I know a little bit about it. Well, my father was a vet mason, and it's all about doing good and helping others. And But there's a secretive element to it. I'm not quite sure why they wanted to remain so secretive. Well, the problem was in the old days when you had some... Um, depends who was in power at the time, and they all wanted to convert mm -hmm. you. You had to keep it secret because it would have got in the way. Yeah. And it just it's not so secret now. You should go to the Freemasons Lodge in in the centre of London. It's Anyone can go there. Mm -hmm. It's the most incredible building ever. There's an Indian room, there's an Egyptian room, and everything is to do with love and helping others. Well, I but like one that. Ha but one has to dig a bit deep. It's not just an old boy's Kind of sounds like a Sai Baba Centre where <laughs> people are perfectly into Seva. Actually, they are. Yeah. There are Masonic schools, uh, hospitals, they're, but pe they don't blow their own trumpet. Mm -hmm. Okay, going down. We're going down to what you call the ground floor. Do you have a basement here? Or no, 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 no. All the neighbors around here are doing awful things. They're kind of going down two floors so okay. they can stick swimming pools and oh, no. garages, which I think is a scandal, an outrage. They're going down two floors. Wow. Yeah, just the house behind me. I don't know why the councils agree to this, but you know. Okay. Have, has anybody from the council uh, peeked into your house at all? Because <laughs> they would love it. I don't think they would. They would put this on the historic tourist stopover spots. Anyway. Yeah, that's the little kitchen. Yeah. But you probably don't need much in the kitchen. Well, I'd like, uh, I, believe me, I'm sure it's going to be just like all the other rooms, and it, it is. <laughs> it absolutely is. Well, the trouble is, because I'm not the trouble is, the thing is, I've lived in one place for so long that that I just have accumulated. I have actually had to put a bit of a stop to accumulation. You could say Kensington and Chelsea, because it's that's the borough. Okay, the and you grew up down the street, you down told me. Down the next street. I went to school one stop on the tube. Well, I used to walk it. Did you tell me you delivered papers or some such thing? I was thing a here? newspaper boy for, from the age of 11 to 15. <laughs> I got 12 and 6 a week, and then well, I got a raise of 17 pounds, and 6. six pence, no, no, 12 shillings, and that's old money. <laughs> Probably the equivalent of about 60p. But it was the first money I'd ever made, and I was so proud of it. And it went to going to me paying for my drum lessons. Uh huh. And I became, I wanted to be a drummer when I was very young, when I was 13. Oh, that's great. So I paid for my drums and my drum lessons. Well, so, no, it didn't shock me. And I've had some experience before from long distance where he's done a few things that nobody that he could have known the question I was asking inside myself, and, and he immediately answered it while looking at me, but from a distance mm -hmm. of about 20 rows of people. Mm. So, so you reacted to that So he, to, he took the thing, went into the temp, the Mandir, the temple area, and I thought, right, I'll, make, I'll print up the first CD. So I then went on to make three more under the name of Third Man, budgeons with kind of trancey things, making them quite different to could, how the could tradition... Could we find those online if we went looking for them under the name Third Man? No, you'd be, you'd find them under the name of Dana Gillespie okay. because they, they printed them in India and they kept putting stickers on it saying featuring Dana Gillespie. So it defeated the, yeah. the thing of me being anonymous. So now I just have done, I've done about 11 or 12, I can't remember, Bunjan uh, CDs. Mm -hmm. Yes, I always wanted to find somebody who'd be able to market them. I'm a great composer. I mean, I don't mean I'm great like that, but I'm great at certain things, which is the performance side and the musical side, but I'm not great at the pushing side. Most artists aren't. In the old days, you had your agency. You mean marketing you know, your own stuff? Yeah. God, yeah. it's a pain. Yeah. So I was never been good at that, but Sai Barbara has blessed all of them, uh, all of the CDs. He's even blessed quite a few blues CDs. Um, Why not? They're so evocative. Well, and also he once said that 
blues is very spiritual music, which it is. And, and this was proved after I made my first, the, the first, you know, third man CD. I then get a call saying that, would you like to sing for the 70th birthday, which is, would I? Yes. And I thought, well, hey, this is it. I'm going to be doing budgeons because I've just done this CD. Mm -hmm. And no, no, no. He wants you to do your Western music, which means blues. Now, because I'm a specialist in highly unsuitable blues, I'm in songs <laughs> with funny lyrics, but I won't blue your right. uh, your video now. There's no <clears> need. <throat> it's all online. But funny lyrics. They're not crude. They're just how mm -hmm. it was in the 20s, 30s and 40s. Double entendre is this. Really... Oh, extreme double yeah. entendre. Yeah. And, uh, but funny, tongue in cheek stuff. So I thought, well, I'll have to get a band. I asked my blues band here, listen, do you want to come and do a, a gig in India? for no money, you won't be able to eat meat, you can't you'll drink or smoke, the way. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't get paid. And strangely enough, half of them said no, there wasn't a stampede, but the other half said yes. And then I got two other guys from Vienna who were bold enough to go, hey, a gig, why not? Let's wear adventurous. And off we got to play in the stadium. There was a week long of kind of all the big Indian stars. This is the 70th birthday. 70th birthday. Okay. Big posters everywhere. And for the first time ever, I'm not in the sheds. I've got a room on my own. I've got a huge thing saying artiste on <laughs> pressed here that got you into the front of the queue everywhere. It made me feel rather embarrassed. And But I had people kind of leading me about. And on the very last day, on the 23rd, when all the big stars had played, was when they put me on. And this was kind of very bizarre. Nobody knew, nobody had ever had blues there. Uh, maybe, I think, what's that guy who'd done some jazz there? Oh, remember. yeah, he, uh, uh, the trumpet player? Yes, I've got a book of his up there. There's a book up there called Broads, Boos, no, Bands, Boos, and Broads. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Maynard Ferguson. Maynard Ferguson. That's it, and there is the picture. Hold on, with Swami. Hold, it, hold it steady. There, I got it. I got it. There it is. Are you in this picture? No, no, this is, I don't know what year it is. Is Maynard Ferguson in this picture? Yes. Can you point him out to me? No, I can't okay. because if I, I think he's in the white. So there I am with my blues band. On the 23rd, everyone is waiting for the big thing when Swami is going to get on the jeweler. My blues band and I come out and by this time, we're doing boogie woogie and blues mm -hmm. as we always do. But I wrote suitable lyrics so i did one song i wrote a song called i sigh for you sigh with mm -hmm. a double meaning i wrote a boogie woogie called happy birthday baba mm -hmm. and i don't i think it's i never really heard happy birthday songs to him like that before and i know and i sang a slow blues called big daddy because sometimes they used to call him big daddy <laughs> and what else is anyway well he obviously loved them all well the moment we started he stands up off the normal the silver chair mm -hmm. goes straight to the jeweler and he's swinging in the jeweler while this blues is going on and while 99.9 .9 of the indian audience are hating what is this stuff with drums a drum kit an electric guitar they didn't and have drum kits were not at all familiar with no them, and even in england you know people are not that savvy mm -hmm. on blues i mean we've heard of eric clapton and mm -hmm. you know white blues musicians yeah. but uh, and we got the stones of course but you know, over there, new territory. So I knew I was probably going to be loathed. And uh, everyone said, don't worry, you know, he always takes people in for an interview. And by this time, I was desperate after all these years to just see what the inside of the interview room looked like. I mm -hmm. mean, I know interview was always more important than interview, but I was just curious, wanted to know what it was like. So everyone said, you know, next day, don't worry, he sees everyone. So the next day, all the kind of artists with their rosettes are lined up and there's all the cricket stars and the musician stars. And Swami comes out and he goes, you, you, and he picks every single person except for me. And he knows you're the singer. And Yeah, of course. And I'm the only one that's left out on my own. Did you while melt? All the others went in. I had a marvelous mother who always said to me, whatever you do in life, you've got to be gracious. So I knew I'd have to stand up, hold my head high, chew on the inside of my gums, which were by this time bleeding so that I didn't cry, and walk out as if I didn't care. But of course I did. I get back to my room and I howl into my pillow. He did see me a few months later, but I had a lesson. I had to learn a lesson to be absolutely squashed down. And But from any time after that, 
everything kind of changed. The, because the next year he asked me to sing with his students. And mm -hmm. I think it's the first time a white woman's been let loose alone, mm -hmm. a single white woman with his <laughs> golden All boys. His boys students, yeah. Yeah, so I had seven beautiful, marvelous golden boys. And they'd never paid, played this Western music before. Um, they thought they were going to be doing something with bludgeons. No, no. Every day we'd practice, or sometimes we'd be in the Purna Chandra Hall, and, and sometimes Swami would appear in the curtains behind, and he might go just like that and peep through, or sometimes down there to fool us, or <laughs> sometimes up there. And I, this is my the biggest love I've ever had, apart from Swami, has been music. And I'm always going like this, and I'm sure that a few people were somewhat horrified. But one day Swami came out and said on the men's veranda, look at Dana. He's always going like this. He did, and he, that. he did me better than me, of course. <laughs> I was still, for the 75th birthday, I was still in Chalva Kameez with a dupata, a shawl. He used to come to the backstage area and make sure it was pinned correctly, because no he can't kidding. have me going, da da! <laughs> I never had a question. I never asked him anything. But one time he did say to me, Look, do you want to ask me a question? So I said to him, Swami, what's the point of this all? Meaning, what's mm -hmm. the point of life? And, he just looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and he said five very important words. And I repeat this often and often. Play the game, be happy. Oh guardian blue angel, spread your wings over this weary child. So safe and sound, I'm tired of running wild. There's been so many times When you saved me from the lion's jaw Saved me from myself You've opened up the door Oh, guardian blue angel Teach me how to fly Take this broken angel Back to the sky Take this broken heart Back to the light Oh, help this restless soul take flight the one that watches over me take away my tears and show me how to see with my hand in yours there's a chance I can make it through in these troubled times I turn to Oh, guardian blue angel, teach me how to fly. Take this broken angel back to the sky. Take this broken heart back to the light. Oh, help this restless soul take flight.
Thank you.